Our last speaker this morning is Dr. Daniel Kuritskus. He is the Harriet uh, Ryan Elby Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases at Brigham, Brigham's and Women's Hospital in Boston. He received his undergraduate training uh, at Yale and his medical training at Harvard Medical School. He's published extensively and we uh, mostly know him here in the region as the previous chair of the ACTG. He served as a member of the NIH Office of AIDS Research Advisory Council and was a member of the US Department of Health and Human Services panel on guidelines for ART just quoted by Dr. Iskandar. He has served on several editorial boards. He's currently still an associate editor for the Journal of Infectious Diseases. He focuses on HIV therapeutics, antiretroviral drug resistance and HIV eradication. And we are honored that today he will address for us how to best manage HIV resistance. Dr. Kuritskis. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have a chance to uh, speak with you again. Uh, this morning I'll be talking about the art of managing uh, HIV drug resistance. Uh, my disclosures haven't changed in the last two days. Uh, so um, let's talk about the problem of drug resistance in the treatment of HIV infection. Uh, unlike antimicrobial resistance, where we see the spread in the environment through the use of antibiotics in animal feed and the uh, nosocomial acquisition of uh, drug-resistant uh, uh, microorganisms, emergence of drug resistance in HIV occurs really uh, de novo in each treated person when treatment doesn't go right. And, and the emergence of resistance is a particular problem with RNA viruses, not limited to HIV, but uh, also seen with influenza, with hepatitis C virus, uh, and that, of course, includes retroviruses. It's important to remember that in an infected individual, the virus population is not homogenous or clonal. It, it really represents a quasi-species of very closely related but slightly different uh, individual viral species that we term a quasi-species. And the genetically distinct variants within this quasi-species evolve from the initial oligoclonal inoculum, the one or two uh, viruses that succeed in establishing infection uh, following transmission. And these variants are generated by the error-prone RNA-dependent polymerase. RNA de uh, polymerases lack a proofreading function, and so when the wrong base is incorporated during the process of viral replication, there's no mechanism for excising it, uh, and it remains uh, in the viral genome then as a mutation. But resistance has changed over the decades. Uh, in, the, uh, in the bad old days, the era of monotherapy and dual therapy, and I mean uh, inappropriate dual therapy, not to be confused with the new era of appropriate dual therapy, such as dolutegravir 3TC or dolutegravir rolpivirine. Uh, in, the, in the old days, failure to achieve uh, full suppression of HIV replication invariably led to the accumulation of drug resistance mutations, or DRMs. And the accumulation of these DRMs led to increasing within-class cross-resistance. So, for example, the more mutations that conferred resistance to AZT, the more uh, likely the virus was to be resistant to stavudine and to abacavir and even to tenofovir. Addition of single agents as new drugs uh, were uh, as new drugs were developed uh, equated to serial monotherapy. So people who started treatment with zidovudine, who then added lamivudine to their regimen, became resistant to both drugs. And then when indinavir uh, was added as a protease inhibitor, uh, resistance promptly emerged to the third uh, agent, uh, and so on, generating multi-drug uh, resistant viruses or MDR HIV. There was also transmission of drug-resistant virus, including uh, transmission of multidrug-resistant virus, which exacerbated the problem. But this changed over the uh, decades as therapy improved and as the success of, uh, of antiretroviral therapy and the likelihood of achieving full virologic suppression uh, became uh, uh, greater and greater uh, given the uh, better potency, greater tolerability, and simplicity of uh, contemporary regimens. And that's uh, illustrated on this slide that I'll uh, spend a moment to take you through. Here, if we just look at all uh, individuals uh, treated uh, in the period from uh, 1999 through 2013, um, uh, you can see that the, uh, the number of individuals, and these are data from Switzerland, uh, from Andreas Scherer and colleagues from the Swiss HIV cohort, the number of individuals receiving treatment increased. Uh, those who uh, ever had virologic failure uh, to a single or dual nucleoside drug uh, decreased slightly, 
uh, those who had had genotyping performed at the time of treatment initiation increased, uh, and uh, uh, those who ever had drug resistance uh, had increased somewhat as well. But if we break this down into the era during which people started therapy, you can see that for those who started therapy before uh, 1999, uh, they, there was a diminishing number of those individuals, but they are the people who contributed the most in terms of, uh, of having had drug resistance, shown here in these uh, uh, pink or red uh, circles. But as we look at the most recent period from 2007 to 2013, you can see that uh, uh, there was a big increase in the number of people starting on therapy, but very few, uh, very few people had any evidence of drug resistance and hardly anybody uh, had th uh, triple class resistance. So better therapy leads to more complete viral suppression and prevents the emergence of HIV drug resistance. Now, uh, the DHHS guidelines for managing uh, treatment uh, in patients with virologic failure have not changed very much uh, over the years. Uh, these are the, from the 2019 guidelines. I, uh, I hadn't had a chance since the new guidelines came out in December to uh, update the citation on the slide, but there really aren't any uh, significant changes in how uh, we approach uh, uh, patients with virologic failure. Uh, the, the first steps are to uh, to sit down with the patient and understand what is it about the regimen that isn't working for them. You, we, you need to evaluate adherence to their thera therapy, uh, potential for drug-drug interactions, not only among the antiretrovirals, but importantly, between the antiretrovirals and other drugs they may be taking for comorbid conditions and, and uh, other uh, home remedies or allopathic medications that they may be taking. Uh, the tolerability of the regimen, uh, which may be uh, driving uh, challenges with adherence, uh, and the uh, potential for uh, previously existing uh, resistance to the regimen. Where accessible, it's then important to perform drug resistance testing in order to assess uh, the activity of the uh, drugs in the regimen and whether any of those drugs might be reused in a subsequent regimen with the goal of uh, reestablishing virologic uh, suppression uh, with the second or later line of, uh, of therapy. A new regimen should include at least two and preferably three fully active agents, although I have to say the data, as I'll show you, really are uh, converging on uh, probably two drugs, uh, so long as they're fully active and have an adequate genetic barrier to resistant, being sufficient to reestablish and then maintain a virologic suppression. Adding a single new drug to a virologically failing regimen is not recommended because it really recapitulates this uh, prior history of virtual monotherapy, uh, and if the wrong single drug is added to a failing regimen, uh, the likely outcome is incomplete viral suppression and loss of that uh, new drug. That said, for some very highly uh, treatment experienced patients with extensive drug resistance, maximal virologic suppression may not be possible. But in that case, persisting with some form of therapy uh, that's designed to minimize toxicity uh, and preserve CD4 cell counts and uh, may still delay clinical progression uh, and is an important uh, goal to, uh, to achieve. I touched on the issue of uh, pre-existing drug resistance, and we know from uh, work uh, done through the AIDS Clinical Trials Group uh, uh, now uh, uh, more than a decade ago that pre-existing drug resistance, in this uh, situation most likely transmitted drug resistance, has a, a significant negative impact on uh, the success of the regimen if the transmitted resistance is resistance to the non-nucleoside RT inhibitors and if uh, an efavirenz or an avirapine-based regimen is used. So in this uh, retrospective uh, analysis, we made use of uh, baseline samples from ACTG 5095, which studied efavirenz in combination with various uh, nucleoside uh, RT inhibitors, and the study was initiated in an era before uh, pre-treatment and uh, drug, drug resistance testing was uh, standard in the United States, and so uh, patients who are, uh, enrolled in the study uh, were not pre-screened for the presence of resistance. Then we went back to the baseline samples, did viral genotyping, and identified uh, those who had uh, resistance to uh, efavirenz uh, or the other NNRTIs and showed that uh, those uh, participants were two and a half times more likely uh, to uh, develop uh, virologic failure over the course of the study compared to those who were, um, uh, had wild-type virus. 
And what you see is that having resistance did not always lead to failure. A small number of people uh, managed to remain virologically suppressed. Uh, and not having resistance was certainly no guarantee of success because all of the issues around adherence and, and tolerability still played an important role. So resistance is an important determinant of treatment success, but it's not the sole determinant of treatment success. Now, this study was done with standard Sanger sequencing, and if you apply uh, more sensitive techniques to uh, identify minority variants, and Denise uh, talked about the importance of minority variants contributing to resistance to the BNABs, well, uh, they're certainly important as well uh, in determining resistance to uh, 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 standard uh, small molecule forms of, of therapy. And here, uh, John Lee in my group did a uh, a pooled analysis of data from 10 different studies looking at patient level data uh, where uh, individuals uh, in the studies, uh, different investigators had gone back using a variety of techniques including next generation sequencing and allele specific PCR to very sensitively uh, detect the presence of resistance to the non-nucleoside RT inhibitors and showed uh, that again there was about a two and a half times greater risk of uh, virologic failure uh, if you had pre-existing minority variants which were undetectable by standard uh, uh, viral genotyping uh, compared to those uh, who did not. But again, you'll see that more than half of the participants who did have uh, minority variants uh, managed to be successfully suppressed. So in this situation, we can say that uh, the very sensitive techniques for detecting minority variants may have high sensitivity but low specificity for, uh, and therefore uh, not terribly good po uh, predictive value for who might fail on uh, a particular regimen. Now the importance of, uh, I, I focused up until now on the importance of uh, uh, pre-existing resistance to the non-nucleoside RT inhibitors. Resistance to the nucleoside RT inhibitors uh, has been shown to have much less of an impact on uh, contemporary regimens, including uh, NNRTI-based and boosted protease inhibitor-based uh, regimens. And these data are from Anna Maria Giretti in London uh, and show you that uh, here the solid lines are those who had no resistance and the dotted lines are people who had resistance. The difference between the dotted and solid lines are really not statistically significant uh, it, because it, it appears that having uh, uh, transmitted resistance numerically made you slightly more likely to succeed, but that's uh, not uh, really a, a, a significant finding here. Uh, and what you'll notice as well is that the NR NNRTI regimens actually did better than the boosted PI regimens, but this is not a randomized study. This is a retrospective uh, uh, cohort analysis. But these uh, uh, results have been challenged by the findings in the ANRS uh, 12249 uh, study, the TASP trial, uh, where uh, looking at uh, comparing the, uh, the absence of any uh, previously existing drug resistance to the resistance only to the non-nucleoside RT inhibitors or presence of resistance to both the non-nukes and the nucleoside RT inhibitors, uh, they were unable to see uh, any difference if you had only NNRTI transmitted resistance, but there was a difference if you had resistance to both classes. And recently, um, in a thousand participant cohort in uh, KwaZulu-Natal, uh, Vince Marconi, uh, John Lee, and I have been able to show very similar results where, and we'll be presenting those data at, at CROI, that showing that uh, there is about a two and a half times greater likelihood of failure if you have resistance to both uh, and in RTIs, in that case, of Fabrins uh, and either 3TC or Tenofovir. Well, the, the data I showed you from Anna Marie uh, and uh, our previous data were all based on uh, non nucleoside RT inhibitor failure and uh, the use of boosted protease inhibitors uh, in second line regimens. What about the use of um, uh, uh, integrase inhibitors. Are they as reliable and as potent as boosted PIs uh, for use in second line? Because we know that the second line study, Ernest and SELECT, all showed persistent activity of uh, some of the nucleosides despite the presence of resistance, although it's important to note that there were very few participants in those first three trials who had uh, a K65R mutation that confers resistance to tenofovir, now the more common component of the viral backbone. 
uh, and success of the second line regimens was largely based on a boosted PI regimen. And so that uh, the question then is, can a drug like dolutegravir or potentially bictegravir take the place of a boosted PI uh, in a second line regimen uh, if there is a pre-existing uh, nucleoside resistance? And that's the subject of the Dawning study, which compared uh, dolutegravir with two nucleoside RT inhibitors to boosted lopinavir with two uh, nucleoside RT inhibitors in uh, participants who were failing on a, um, uh, a uh, two nuke plus NNRTI uh, first line regimen. They had to have been receiving that regimen for at least six months, uh, have uh, virus loads of above 400 copies on two occasions, uh, and no uh, primary resistance to PIs or to integrase inhibitors. So one of the uh, key aspects of this study, which uh, although it was conducted in resource limited settings, is that it, it introduced and made available a technology that is not necessarily widely available in routine clinical practice. And the primary endpoint was achieving uh, viral suppression to less than 50 copies per mil at week 48 using the uh, FDA snapshot analysis. And what the study showed was that uh, dolutegravir uh, outperformed uh, boosted lopinavir uh, by a, a wide margin, not only achieving non-inferiority, but actually demonstrating uh, superiority, uh, as you can see here uh, uh, in this analysis. And um, uh, that uh, uh, was uh, uh, also true in the per-protocol analysis shown in the hatched bars uh, here. Now, one of the issues that arises is um, although uh, there was a superiority of dolutegravir. It's not clear that that's due to greater virologic activity so much as better tolerability of dolutegravir as compared to the uh, uh, ritonavir boosted lopinavir regimen. A number of uh, uh, sub analyses were subsequently presented asking how did resistance to different components of the regimen affect the outcome of, in the study, and uh, it, the, that really had little impact. So in this slide, uh, the, uh, what you're seeing is the impact of resistance to uh, lamivudine or m with a mutation at the uh, RT position 184, uh, and here the, the blue bars are the dolutegravir arm and the orange bars are the boosted lopinavir arm. And you can see the numbers are really pretty similar across the board uh, for the study overall, whether you did or did not have a 184B mutation and whether you did or did not use either 3TC or, or FTC in the context of a 184 mutation. In each setting, uh, dolutegravir still outperformed lopinavir and the uh, level of uh, the rate of success didn't change. Now, the data were also analyzed with respect to the presence of the K65R mutation, but here there are a couple of shortcomings in, in the data, it's certainly not the fault of the investigators, but just the, uh, the context in which the study was performed. Uh, there were only 15 participants who had a K65R mutation who also received tenofovir, and the, because of the study design, they had to re receive at least one active nucleoside RT inhibitor. So if they had a 65R, which confers resistance to tenofovir and uh, lamivudine or amtricitabine, they must have been also receiving zidovudine in order to have an active drug. Uh, and um, so we don't really have data that address the question of what happens if you use tenofovir in the setting of a 65R mutation uh, together with dolutegravir, and that's extremely important uh, given the uh, rollout that is now occurring. Well, uh, focusing uh, now on resistance to the integrase inhibitors, you can see in this uh, chart taken from the uh, Stanford Drug Resistance Database that there's extensive uh, cross-resistance among these uh, uh, drugs. The, some of the mutations have a much greater impact on the first generation of integrase inhibitors, raltegravir and elvitegravir, uh, and the 148 mutation, uh, when coupled with other, drug, uh, other mutations, having a bigger impact on dolutegravir and bictegravir. So the Viking study looked at uh, different doses of dolutegravir in uh, uh, participants who had previously failed on a raltegravir containing regimen and had accumulated uh, different uh, numbers uh, and types of raltegravir resistance mutations. And here what you see is the fold resistance to dolutegravir increases with increasing numbers of mutations, particularly when the 148 mutation is included uh, with uh, other mutations. Uh, and this study 
uh, also found that when dolutegravir was administered twice daily, uh, there was a better uh, success rate than uh, uh, in uh, the individuals who received dolutegravir uh, once daily, hence the recommendation to use dolutegravir twice a day uh, in the setting of prior integrase inhibitor resistance. Uh, that is a, a somewhat soft result, however, because it also turned out that the highest levels of resistance were in the once daily arm, so we don't really have parity in terms of the level of dolutegravir resistance, uh, and you obviously couldn't randomize people to have uh, different levels of, uh, of resistance in this study. Well, let's turn now to some of the newer drugs that are available uh, or just becoming available for the treatment of uh, p p uh, patients with highly resistant virus. And the first of these is a monoclonal antibody uh, called ibolizumab. Uh, ibolizumab was initially a, 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 a monoclonal antibody isolated in mice. It, it targets the second domain in the CD4 molecule. And the, mo the uh, antibody was then genetically re-engineered to be humanized so that it would be less likely to generate antibodies when administered to people. And it inhibits post-virus, uh, uh, post-binding entry of the virus. Uh, so as you can see here, the heavy and light chain of the antibody uh, bind to this uh, second domain of CD4. So they leave available the uh, uh, tip of the CD4 molecule to which GP120 binds. So the virus can bind to CD4, but then it can't undergo the necessary rearrangements to engage the co-receptor and, and proceed with viral fusion uh, with the cell membrane. Uh, years ago, we did the uh, phase one, uh, actually 15 years ago, uh, we did the phase one study of uh, ibolizumab, single ascending dose study, and you can see that uh, a single infusion led to uh, up to about a 1.4 or 1.3 log reduction in uh, plasma HIV RNA that took about 14 days to achieve. Uh, so slow virologic decline, uh, but uh, m a moderately potent activity. Um, there were a series of uh, misadventures with this molecule in terms of its uh, clinical development, but finally uh, a, a, a phase three study using the novel uh, salvage therapy trial design uh, that had been worked out uh, through the Forum for HIV Collaborative Research in uh, partnership with the FDA, with the community, and with investigators uh, was done that led to the approval of this drug. And so this is a really unique type of phase three study. Uh, this study, uh, uh, looked at participants who had limited treatment options, uh, enrolled them into uh, the trial, and then followed them for seven days doing absolutely nothing. And this was just to establish the baseline variability in virus load. Then all of the participants uh, got a single loading dose of ibolizumab, and the primary endpoint was 14 days later not uh, at 48 weeks, not at 96 weeks, and no comparison arm, because the comparison is where was your virus load at day 14 compared to was it, where it was at day seven, and was the change from day seven to 14 different than the change from zero to seven, which was, uh, should be essentially zero change. After day 14, uh, participants could optimize their background regimens if they had any b other drugs that might be added to the regimen, and then they were followed uh, for additional time uh, for, for safety of the ibolizumab, uh, and during which they were receiving uh, 800 milligram uh, IV doses every two weeks. What you can see uh, from the table here is that uh, the, only a single individual in the control period had a decline in virus load of more of half a log or greater, uh, whereas during the uh, monotherapy period, uh, 33 of the participants had uh, such a decrease. Uh, 24 of them achieved a one log decrease, with the mean change in virus load being just over uh, one log uh, compared to no change during the control period, and this was uh, highly uh, significant. But you note, this phase three study had only 40 participants in it. So this is really uh, a, a novel uh, way of, of doing business. And it, the uh, intent is to minimize the number of people who are exposed to uh, potentially uh, partially active regimens. Uh, but if we look at more classic criteria for success, you'll see that um, in the overall intention to treat population, only about half of the participants achieved fully undetectable uh, virus loads. Uh, that seemed to depend uh, on the baseline CD4 count, much less success in patients with more advanced disease compared to those with uh, uh, less advanced disease. And um, 
the uh, 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 improvement in CD4 count uh, likewise depended on where you started with uh, just about a 70 cell increase overall, but closer to 100 cell increase in those who entered with more than uh, 50 cells to begin with. Resistance does emerge to ibalizumab, however, and these are data uh, developed by um, uh, Toma and colleagues from Virologic uh, using samples obtained in the phase 1b trial, and you'll notice this uh, odd change in the shape of the inhibition curve. Uh, we don't see a shift to the right of the IC50, but a flattening of the curve, which is classic for non-competitive inhibitors, as we saw with resistance to the CCR5 antagonist, uh, Maraviroc. Uh, and these mutations occur uh, in uh, the interface where the antibody binds to the, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the, you might be surprised that there are resistance mutations that occur because the antibody doesn't bind the virus, it binds CD4, but the mutations occur uh, at the interface where the uh, uh, virus interacts with, with CD4. Well, let me spend the last couple of minutes talking about another new agent, Fostemzivir, uh, which is an, uh, also an entry inhibitor. Fostemzivir is a prodrug of temzivir. Uh, you can see temzivir here, the active drug, and this is the phos, uh, uh, phos phosphorylated version. Uh, this is a first-in-class attachment inhibitor that binds to GP120, therefore prevents viral attachment, is active against viruses regardless of which co-receptor they use, and is synergistic or additive uh, together with other anti-HIV drugs. Uh, for this uh, uh, phase three trial, a somewhat different design was used. Here, two studies were done in parallel, a randomized study where uh, participants who had at least one remaining uh, available drug were randomized three to one to uh, uh, either get placebo or fostemzivir for an eight-day period with the primary endpoint being the change in virus load between uh, day uh, one and day eight. And then they, everybody received open label drug and optimized their background regimen. In addition, for those who had no uh, remaining options in a form of a compassionate uh, use uh, trial rolled into the phase three trial, uh, the, the individuals were allowed to simply receive fostemzivir and uh, do what they could with their background regimen. You see that this was a very highly uh, treatment experienced group. Uh, even 70% uh, in the, the non-randomized cohort had already uh, uh, tried in Fuvertide. Uh, and if you look at uh, the number of uh, agents that were available, uh, you can see that, that nearly 80% of those in the non-randomized cohort had no, no other drugs available, uh, whereas about half of the participants in the randomized group had one or two drugs available to add uh, to the uh, fostemzivir. And uh, the clinical endpoint, the primary endpoint showed a 0.8 log reduction at uh, uh, day uh, eight compared to a 0.17 log reduction in the placebo group. Uh, that was statistically uh, significant. Uh, and then if you look at the uh, proportion who actually achieved full virologic suppression, um, the results are not uh, all that uh, encouraging. About 57% in the randomized cohort uh, got to less than 50 copies. About 80% uh, achieved uh, uh, suppression to less than 200 copies. But in the, um, uh, in the open label group, uh, the uh, compassionate use group, uh, that number was closer to 40% uh, percent achieving full suppression. Uh, interestingly, there was a continuous increase in CD4 counts uh, over t time in the randomized group, a plateau in the CD4 counts in the non-randomized group, and the significance of that is still being explored. So let me finish by uh, s summarizing and saying that the goal of treatment uh, for patients with complex uh, antiretroviral uh, treatment histories is full virologic suppression, as it is for initial therapy. New drugs with novel mechanisms of action increase our options for constructing treatment regimens that contain two or more active drugs. But even when full virologic suppression can't be achieved, a regimen should still be administered and designed to minimize toxicity, preserve CD4 counts, and hopefully uh, delay clinical progression while waiting uh, for the next new drug to come along. And with that, let me thank you for your attention and uh, hope you enjoy the remainder of the conference.